Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bon Jovi, and I'm delighted and honored to be joined today by Mariana Mazzucato. Mariana is a professor of economics at University College London, where she is founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Currently, Mariana advises policymakers around the world on innovation-led, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Her advisory roles are numerous. She is the chair of the World Health Organization's Council on the Economics of Health for All, and she's a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisors, among many other roles. Mariana is also the author of two highly acclaimed books, The Entrepreneurial State, which investigates the critical role that states play in driving growth, and The Value of Everything, which looks at how value creation needs to be rewarded over value extraction. Mariana is here with us today to discuss her newest book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. Taking inspiration from the moonshot programs like Apollo, which successfully coordinated public and private sectors on a massive scale, Mariana calls for the same level of boldness and experimentation to be applied to the biggest problems of our time. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about today. Now, throughout our talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head. And when you do, please go ahead and add them to the chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Mariana to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Mariana, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So your book outlines a different vision for capitalism, and it's anchored in rethinking the story that we tell ourselves about the role that governments play in setting strategy and shaping markets, interacting with business. Can you start by telling us what this mission-oriented approach to governments is? Sure. And, you know, I actually wrote the book on the back of basically a decade of trying to get policymakers at different levels, you know, city, regional, national, international, to think in a mission-oriented way. So the idea is that instead of having policies that basically just hand out money, whether it's through subsidies, guarantees, co-investment strategies, to different types of sectors, different types of companies, you'll know that a lot of policies around small, medium enterprises or different types of technologies, to kind of backtrack and say, well, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the mission? What's the targeted outcome you're actually going for? And then you ask yourself, like, how can we get every sector to be part of this instead of you know, having, say, an industrial strategy that comes up with five top sectors. In the UK, these were, what were they? Uh, aerospace, automobiles, financial services, life sciences, and the creative sector. You know, to do what? <laughs> so to start with the problems, the idea is that you look at the SDGs, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that every country from the US to Congo to Brazil to, you know, France have signed up to, turn those SDGs, these 17 broad goals, into targeted missions like getting 90% of the plastic out of the ocean, like having 100 carbon neutral cities across Europe, or societal ones, social ones, like fighting knife crime in London, the city where I live, zero knife crime amongst teenagers. And then, you know, reframe your policy instruments, whether it's an industrial strategy, a procurement strategy, different design for loans and grants, to galvanize as much bottom-up experimentation within the business community and other types of organizations to find solutions for those problems. And that just, again, at the design level of the policies means a real shift. And lastly, it also means asking who sets these missions in the first place. So the Apollo program, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, was pretty top down by kind of Kennedy and the gang. Increasingly, these societal missions, which are much harder than purely technological ones, need much more stakeholder engagement in the first place. You know, so getting, say, resident associations and social housing to come together alongside policymakers and businesses to even talk about what does a sustainability strategy even look like and what does that mean, not just for retrofitting, saying housing, but actually to really foster that kind of sustainable living with urban food systems and more. Yeah, and your book outlines much of the promise that is available with these approaches and also many of the challenges in getting there. One of those challenges is that public sector leaders and managers are not really taught or encouraged to think outside the box or to take these types of calculated risks, whereas their counterparts in the private sector really have risk taking and experimentation woven into their identity. How does this need to change? And if so, how can we go about doing that? So absolutely. I mean, by the way, in my book, The Entrepreneurial State, I tried to debunk this idea, actually, that the right. private sector has all this risk taking embedded in it. There's many right. private sector companies that don't take risks that are actually perfectly happy with the status quo. And some do take risks. Some are very innovative. And, 
And the real question is how can we, instead of talking about it at an individual level, like an individual company, how can we build an entrepreneurial ecosystem? And what is the new type of relationship we need between the public and the private sector to actually foster that? And coming to your question, within our bureaucracies, we don't foster risk-taking and experimentation. In fact, as soon as a civil servant makes a mistake, <laughs> often, you know, the story's on the front page of the newspaper and, you know, yeah. telling governments to stop kind of making choices. Often this is called, you know, kind of picking winners. And the idea is that you should just focus on the horizontal background conditions and then let the direction of the economy to be kind of set by business. And that's just very faulty. You know, we would have never had the internet revolution. We would have never had the biotech, nanotech, green tech revolution had the state just played this kind of backseat player. We required investment. We required risk-taking, portfolio thinking, uh, tilting the playing field, shaping markets, and not the usual kind of propaganda about that the best that the government can do is to fix a market failure, level the playing field, facilitate or de-risk the private sector. But unfortunately, because it's so rare to actually have that kind of mentality and that kind of organizational culture, the positive stories are usually just kind of peripheral examples. And then what we actually see out there is an inertial, not very flexible uh, you know, type of bureaucracy, which we can change. You know, We can actually make strategic decisions to train our civil servants in a different way and to frame policy, not just as fixing a problem, fixing market failures, but to co-create and co-shape. And that's what we did have with the Apollo program. You know, that was not government just sitting back and asking business uh, to do certain things and to kind of de-risk it in the process or incentivize it and to assume that all the innovation happens in business. It was very much a direction that was set by government. It was very clear in what the outcome had to be, but very, very open on the how. So, you know, we wouldn't have had this massive amount of innovation in, you know, camera phones, athletic shoes, home insulation, uh, foil blankets, scratch resistant lenses, software uh, that we did have with the Apollo program had it been done in such a linear and boring way as we do policy today. There were so many different sectors involved from nutrition, electronics, software, and so on. But what NASA did so brilliantly was, again, being very very ambitious and inspirational in the outcome. And then it redesigned the tools on the ground like procurement, which I've already mentioned, to really foster as much innovation as possible across the whole economy. And that included both its own kind of investments in the R&D process, but also in terms of business, that meant to actually change the procurement strategy from being what until then was basically cost plus contracts that were very vague, um, both in the outcome, but especially on the kind of costs and the efficiency targets. So they moved so that they were being billed for kind of, you know, high sums without actually then really fostering any, any innovation. They changed it to fixed price contracts, almost like a prize scheme, we could call that today, with constant incentives for quality improvement and innovation. They were also very bold on something that I haven't seen in NASA contracts recently, which was no excess profits, precisely because this was going to be and was a huge collective you know, investment program between public and private sector uh, organizations. The idea was also not to turn this into a gambling casino, basically, <laughs> which is what I think we have space, you know, have in space today. And third, really interesting, I, I didn't even know this until I started reading up on it. Um, the head of procurement was very clear that NASA wouldn't even know how to write the terms of reference with all the different companies that it partnered with, whether it was Honeywell, Motorola, General Electric, if it didn't have its own brain. And so what we've seen since the Apollo program is the opposite, like a whole outsourcing of the public brain to the private sector so that the actual dynamic public-private partnership and the mutualistic symbiotic public-private partnership, which NASA was going after, has, I think, been weakened. And there was a term that Ernest Brackett used, he was the head of procurement at NASA, he said, if we don't invest in our own capabilities, what I call dynamic capabilities of the public sector, we're going to get captured by brochuremanship. The idea that somehow private companies would come in with a sexy brochure, you know, today we have PowerPoints, and kind of say, oh, we're your best partner. Well, he was like, we won't even know. Like, we'll have to just, you know, kind of believe any brochure right. that comes through the door. And that is such a deep thought. I mean, you know, what we've seen in the UK where I live is, you know, the government increasingly relying, for example, on outsourcing to consulting companies like Deloitte that did our test and trace system with COVID-19 without any expertise in that area, you know, right. it's, it's, it's exactly that kind of problem that they already foresaw back then. Yeah. And sticking on that point, as you mentioned, the more governments outsource things uh, to contractors or to external companies, the less capabilities the government has in-house to take on these challenges. 
how can a government that has been outsourcing for so long start to go along the path of reacquiring talent and capabilities in-house? And do you see that as a prerequisite to taking on these, these missions? Yeah, and you know, one of the stories I tell um, that happened you know, with the Apollo program was that they didn't have the right organization actually in the beginning. And there was that you know, fatal day on, what was it? January 27th, 1967, when the Apollo 1 uh, fire happened where those three astronauts died. One of the three astronauts, Gus Grissom, before the fire the same day said, you know, how are we gonna get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Right. And he was referring to the fact that he couldn't hear what was being said to him in the mission control room. And the idea, you know, which we see today in governments where there's so many different silos, each department working within its little fiefdom, so little conversation between departments, which you need, of course, if you're gonna tackle the big goals we have around health, energy, digital platforms, that has to be an you know, interdepartmental conversation with real flexible communication channels. NASA didn't have that, it had to construct that. And interestingly, it happened very much through the leadership of George Mueller, who came from Bell Labs, um, and remind me to say to tell an interesting story about Bell Labs later. Um, yeah. But anyway, so he came in to kind of help foster that more agile, flexible team within NASA. So they basically had different project managers who had their teams. Each project manager was delegated very kind of ambitious goals, but the main thing was to have conversation between also these teams. Um, and that idea today that if governments want to be challenge oriented or purpose oriented or mission oriented, it can't just be about the policy. It has to be about your own organizational design is why I've actually set up at the University College London, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, which is its own department. And our idea is that we need new training. We need a new curriculum, just like, you know, private sector managers go to say Harvard or wherever to do a master's in business administration and the courses being taught are like kind of funky, right? It's like strategic management, organizational behavior, decision sciences. The whole thing is to help you think out of the box and prevent your own organization as it gets larger to get inertial. Um, we haven't had that same kind of, you know, rethink within public institutions. I think Obama once had a really good quote. He said that the last time we rethought government was in the age of black and white TV. <laughs> and right. so, that has to happen also through that kind of rethink, you know, a new training, new curriculum for the civil service. Our curriculum, for example, starts with the idea of value. Like what is the underlying idea of how value is created that needs to be rethought if we want that co-creation of value and not just one actor, you know, being told to take risks and the other one de-risking it. What does right. it mean for creative bureaucracies? There's no reason the word bureaucratic should be a negative word. There's bad bureaucracies and dynamic bureaucracies. What does it mean to create a creative democracy. What does it mean to bring design thinking to how we govern digital platforms? And you know, I should just remind the viewers and listeners that most of the tech that's in our phones, <laughs> uh, right. smartphones and not stupid phones was invested in by government, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, and so on. Same thing with health, something like 75% uh, of new molecular entities with priority rating in the US, for example, come from National Institute of Health funding in the early high risk stage, same thing with energy. So the big question is not just to have more of that risk taking and investment from the public sector and organizing it in ways that we just were talking about, but also how do you then govern the system to make sure that we're socializing not just risks, but also rewards. We haven't done that with digital platforms. We haven't done that with the health system where the intellectual property rights continue to get abused. They're too wide, they're too strong, they're too upstream. The prices of the drugs don't reflect the fact that the NIH, National Institutes of Health, put in 40 billion a year in health innovation and somehow the prices of the drugs don't reflect that. So, you know, those are all just examples of how we end up even in the best case scenario, putting in public money, but then still allow you know, the profits to get privatized. And even though obviously the spillovers of the knowledge may you know, go be broader than that, that's not enough. We actually have to really design into the tools like intellectual property rights, like the public-private partnerships, like the issues around access, like prices of drugs, these more, um, you know, uh, um, these, processes and systems that reflect that value being collectively created towards a common purpose. Right. And you mentioned in there about how there are good bureaucracies and there's bad bureaucracies. And it seems like there's a certain amount of uh, forgetting the fact many decades later that NASA did have this large bureaucracy. And at the time, there were plenty of people who uh, understood that it was 
uh, a bit messy. And I think your book even has a quote from Werner von Braun that says uh, basically that we can lick gravity, but sometimes the paperwork can be overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a certain amount of, of reteaching the public that, that these things are messy, that they're not going to be some, some clean thing that needs to happen? Yeah, it's a great question. Some of the work we're doing with governments, uh, every time I say we, it's the institute uh, that right. I've set up with all the people I've brought in, right. um, that we're doing with governments, including the UK government, is how can we, for example, even in the process of evaluation of public investments, move away from this very linear, static cost-benefit analysis or net present value right. uh, um, calculation to one that actually captures and takes into account all the dynamic spillovers that happen along the way. You know, the moon landing was interesting, not only because they got to the moon and back, but along the way, all this serendipity happened. And many of those innovations that I talked about before, of which there's many, and if you're interested, just Google NASA's, um, they have a nice little figure that says 20 things we wouldn't have without space travel. You know, right. a lot of those happen serendipitously. You know, the search for one thing leads to the discovery of something else. And that itself should be part of the objective to foster kind of, dynamic set of public policies, which again, bring in and catalyze as many different sectors and bottom-up experimentation. And that itself is one of the objectives. And if you instead have really siloed, you know, uh, again, departments, but also have an approach where you're just seeing yourself as being business friendly, a, a word I hate, because I don't think businesses, or at least ambitious businesses like Google don't necessarily benefit in the long run from business friendly policies. They might just make your profits go up in the short term. But in terms of really fostering that kind of dynamic innovation led growth, that requires a much more bold, again, public private partnership that needs to be, um, again, rethought away from just kind of handouts to, you know, for example, having conditionality attached. One of the interesting things, I'll, I'll just mention it now maybe with Bell Labs in its early uh, days of formation is it actually came out of a period in U.S. history where I believe the U.S. government was much bolder. So when AT&T had the monopoly that it had at the time, the idea was, you know, it's not a monopoly given to you by God, <laughs> just <Right>. like patents, <laughs> you know, intellectual property rights are not God-given rights. You get a 20-year right. monopoly profit given to you by the state. That's what, you know, a patent is. And there's all sorts of reasons why we have patents, which are also good reasons, unless they then get abused. Um, and the idea was at the time with AT&T that AT&T then owed something back for being given a monopoly. What, you know, part of that agreement was that they had to reinvest their profits back into the economy, back into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. Bell Labs was the answer to that. And I believe that that idea of conditionality or social contract should actually be embedded in all sorts of different areas. So again, the public investment into health innovation could come with strings attached again, with the prices of the drugs. And by the way, there is that string attached, but then you need the confidence to implement it. So in that case with prices, there are margin rights that NIH has actually set so that those drugs that, actually the government has set, those drugs that come basically mainly from public funding, at least in the early stage, the prices should reflect that. The US government has never implemented, enacted its right to set that. And that's also because of the story, the narrative that we tell about health innovation is that it's private sector led and the government's there to make sure that we regulate the sector you know, in the right way or redistribute the outcomes in the right way. But the state isn't seen as an active investor or an investor first resort, right? And as soon as you are seen as a risk taker, a co-investor, not just a leveler or a de-risker, I think the confidence also of making sure that the deal that is set is the right one. And in the case of Google, of course, you know, the Google algorithm was, you know, initially super early on invested in by the National Science Foundation. And even with grants of that type that went to, to Bryn and his colleagues could have had conditions attached, which is here's a grant, it's all yours, things go wrong, no worries. It's, you know, you don't owe us anything. But if you then on the back of that publicly funded grant earn over X billion, or whatever that may be that right. the, the lawyers can deal with, a certain percentage of that comes back into a public innovation fund to make that investment again, you know, some sort of, well, public fund um, right. or other things. I mean, you know, equity stakes is something I've written about. Both Tesla and Solyndra received right. the same amount, similar amount of money. Everyone knows about the Solyndra case because it went bad. It right. became another example of government being rubbish. Um, what oh, the Obama administration that had tried to 
direct the stimulus after the financial crisis towards kind of an energy revolution. That's when they set up ARPA-E, you know, modeled around DARPA in 2009. But they also started to give out these guaranteed loans to companies in the renewable energy space. Again, both Tesla and Solyndra. To Tesla, it was so interesting, they just got it wrong. They said to Elon Musk, this is the DOE, Department of Energy, here's a 465 million guaranteed loan. Um, if you don't pay it back, we get 3 million shares in your company. It's like, why would you want 3 million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? You don't right. want that. Of course, they weren't a crappy company, they're a good company. They paid back the loan in 2013. The price per share between 2009, 2013 went from nine to 90. That difference multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. So if you are gonna make those kind of investments, which they did, think of it a bit more dynamically and you know, get, you know, don't just socialize the risks, socialize the rewards as well. And this isn't socialism. This is what any self-respecting venture capitalist would do. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you mentioned there about this, this Solyndra Tesla case, and there's the policy side of it, which is adjusting the ways that the government is providing these loans and, and having that conditionality and things. But then there's also this, this narrative side of things, this storytelling side where, okay. as you mentioned, everyone knows Solyndra and everyone knows that there was government investment in that. And not that many people know that there was an equal government investment in Tesla. How important is that storytelling aspect in, in setting these missions and achieving this change in public perception? It's huge. It's huge, especially to get the right people to even want to come into government. I mean, you know, if, if you have these two kind of brochures in front of you of where to go work right. and one is all colorful and it's like, come <laughs> here, you're going to make decisions, be part of an investment team and we're going to redirect the economy towards, you know, a green uh, transition and another come in and we're going to help incentivize the private sector to do these great things. So we're going to fix market failures along the way and we're going to, you know, level the playing field. Obviously, the first one sounds more interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So in terms of both attracting top talent into government to give them that kind of feel of skin in the game and also that you're part of co-creating a better world and not just like helping someone else do it and facilitating them. Right. I'm Italian, by the way, and I hate the word facilitating. So it comes from right. facile, you know, making things easier. What was so great about the Kennedy speech is he was very clear. It's, you know, we're doing it because it's hard. This is for the Apollo program. We're doing it because it's hard, not because it's easy. Because it's hard means taking on difficulties. It's not about facilitating, making it easier for somebody else to do something. It's we as government and the private sector and increasingly in different sectors, the third sector, will need to co-invest, take on these difficulties together, design our instruments so we really foster a, a great partnership and not what we often see in the health sector, a parasitic partnership. Anyway, and all the other stuff kind of flows. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the challenge is definitely a discursive one. There's a discursive battle. And if we don't get the story right, it, you know, all sorts of things happen, both the hiring that I just mentioned, but also the deal. If the story is that someone else took all the risk, right. of course, it's going to be much easier than for a large pharmaceutical company. But, you know, Google's also in the fault on this. So I'll come back to Google in a minute. Right. Anyway, the large pharmaceutical companies can implement value based pricing, you know, basically letting the prices go to whatever the market will bear with the idea that don't screw with the price because that's going to disincentivize us from innovating. And it's like, but you weren't the only innovator in the first place. So as soon as you make it really clear that it's all a collective you know, value that's being created. And we need the risk taking and the learning by doing and the experimentation by all the different actors, this ability for one side to portray itself as the only kind of wealth creator or risk taker is, right. is lowered. And lastly, definitely for citizens too. I mean, I always think of the Obama care, you know, uh, social innovation that we had finally in the US, some social insurance around health. Right. The, the, the narrative though wasn't there. So when the Tea Party at the time, What's happened to the Tea Party, by the way? I haven't heard that <laughs> word in a while. You know, yeah. like, don't you know? Don't mess with our health care. Um, you know, don't intervene. His his reaction was why intervening was the right thing to do. He didn't he didn't debunk the word intervention. He didn't say sorry, intervening. What are you talking about? Seventy five percent of the drugs were invested in by us. <laughs> you know, right. so it's not just about regulating, redistributing. It's about creating. And by the way, I think that's where the left and progressives globally are getting it wrong. You can't have a progressive agenda, whether it's the Democrats or the Labour Party or whatever party in the world, just about redistribution. You need a narrative, literally politically, in terms of the platforms, about the creation of wealth, not just the redistribution of wealth. And 
really getting a sense, both of the history of where that's do been done right, but also where it's been done wrong, but also for the future, if we want a green you know, economy, what does that actually mean for co-creating, for co-investing, for also reimagining the future we want, but what does it mean literally at the level of portfolio you know, right. investment analysis. And I think there's so little understanding on that. Yeah, yeah. And we talked about expressing this understanding that the government is the early investor in these things in creating innovation. And you also talk about how in your book, governments can't really go at this alone. There needs to be this, this private public partnership. Of course. What, what do you see needing to change in terms of how businesses approach capitalism and approach their um, side of this deal? What in that needs to change? So there is actually quite a, you know, interesting discussion globally on the back of the business roundtable, but also, you know, even the head of BlackRock talking about this stuff about how we need more purpose at the, at the center of investment, how the maximization of shareholder value can't be the only objective in a company. There's this broader term stakeholder value that's kind of thrown out there. I just think that up until now, it, it's been basically just a ploy. Um, and I think it'd be great if we actually took it seriously and literally said, I, I keep coming back to this word design, what would a stakeholder value um, approach to capitalism mean for the design of the ecosystem, for the design of the public-private partnership, for the design of the governance of whether it's digital platforms or you know health systems? What does it mean for, again, intellectual property rights? What does it mean for how we share in the benefits on particular projects, but that will only happen if we backtrack and look at the existing way that public-private partnerships are structured and look at where they're going wrong. And you know, COVID-19 is a perfect place to ask that question because look at the vaccine, it's on the back of huge amounts of both private and public sector investment, but then we get it wrong. <laughs> so we end up with you know vaccine apartheid, as Dr. Tedros says, where 80% of the doses are being hoarded by 10% of the countries. And that can't be resolved just by charity, you know, charitable giving of one country to another country in Africa, wherever. It has to go to the center of the business model. So how can the business model around innovation really be designed around common good, you know, perspectives where in a health pandemic, it has to be done in a common good way. Otherwise, one part of the world will continue to, you know, uh, flourish in terms of, sorry, not flourish, uh, the, the, the virus will continue to mutate right. and so on. So we have to look at experiments, whether it's a vaccine, but again, I think digital platforms are really important where we can look at how the governance of the model itself of production, of distribution, of consumption has to change. And I don't think the stakeholder value or purposeful business has done that. It's just been an internal discussion within corporate governance around sometimes some ESG metrics and so on, but it's har had hardly any effect on the relationship between public and private. Right. And one of the narrative challenges that occurs, especially in the US when there is um, this idea that there's large government spending is that then there's going to be inflation and then that's going to be a problem in the long term. How do how should governments respond to that and think about that as a challenge? So first, I don't think people appreciate how important history is. Um, in the US, but in, in many countries, in the US, you can download the price data from the last 200 years. And I encourage all your you know, uh, geeky people in Google to yeah. do this because you have data and you have good you know, algorithms and so on. You, you, it'll take you a second to do it. Just, just download yeah. it from BLS and other, and B, the, the BEA um, uh, website and look at what you see. What you'll see is constant deflation, right? deflation, which is, we know, bad for the system in terms of the effects it has on, um, on, on, on wages and all sorts of things, um, up until World War II. We also had crises. You can do this by mapping out the GDP data for the last 200 years. Crises, so fine, uh, e economic crises as bad as the Great Crash in 1929, or almost as bad, almost regularly up until World War II. So t today we're used to business cycles. So we get recessions every now and then, but we don't get kind of like great crashes every 10 years, right? right? And that's because government actually started to intervene. So the whole Keynesian revolution, John Maynard Keynes, who you know, basically taught governments worldwide that you need a counter cyclical government, not pro cyclical government. Pro cyclical means that when everyone else is lowering their investment or spending consumers and businesses because of the downside of the business cycle, if government does that too, you get this vicious cycle and what's a recession turns into a depression. The Keynesian revolution stopped that. You started to get counter cyclical government. So what happens after World War II is you start having much more stable output growth. 
no more of these huge dips, but also inflation. So moderate inflation is a normal sign of a healthy growing economy. So what we've seen in recent years where we've had huge kind of growth problems is the normal, uh, also on the back of COVID is, is, you know, the opposite of inflation. So deflation and zero, you know, percent interest rates, which kind of follow from that, the government trying to get, you know, people to consume more. But now that the economy is starting to pick up again, uh, for different reasons, people are now worried of the opposite, right? They're worried about kind of too much inflation. So the first point is to say, don't worry about inflation in and of itself, because that's just a sign of a growing economy. The fact we weren't growing on the back of COVID kind of complete dip um, is, is normal. That's what we used to have all the time. But too much inflation is, of course, a problem. So what is a healthy amount of inflation versus too much inflation is one of the big debates in economic theory. What I think is happening right now is that you have you know, because the economy is kind of picking up, you have that obvious kind of increase from zero to, you know, right. two, three or whatever percent it is. There's no reason it'll go out of bounds as long as the government investment, like the trillion, you know, the four trillion or whatever it is now, two to three to four trillion, right, right. you know, Biden's a stimulus package, as long as it's also expanding productive capacity. When you get big inflation numbers, which of course we should worry about, is when you have, say, government putting money into the system through its different mechanisms without expanding the pie of GDP or productive capacity, because you then just have more money kind of falling on an existing pie of goods and services. If instead what you're doing is also fostering innovation, industrial transformation with conditionality at the center, we should come back to different examples of conditionality later, which you know get private sector investment to follow more machines, more factories, more training, more green transition of those you know social and physical infrastructures and and private structures. Then there's no reason that an increase in the money supply, for example, would would you know increase inflation. You get that if your policies are static, if they just amount to more spending, more government money, and not an expansion of, of that productive capacity. So that's really key that you want your recovery mechanism to be designed so it lands in a more productive, innovative economy and not just one that you're kind of putting helicopter money from the sky. Right. Yeah, and I suppose there's also, again, this, this narrative aspect where you need to have the policies in place that are dynamic and able to um, do the appropriate thing, but then you also need to, to help people understand. As you say, Googlers can go and download this data and do this analysis. But to be able to get that rhetoric on a broader scale is important. And I think you have a quote that the U.S. Um, acts Hamilton, but talks Jefferson or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hamilton, everyone knows who he is now because of the musical. <laughs> yeah. Not because they've been reading my books. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, even my kids haven't read any of my books. They now all know who Hamilton is, who I've been talking about for a long time. He was one of the big proponents of industrial strategy for a long time, whereas Jefferson was at least on the face of it much more about the free market and, you know, let business do its thing. Um, and so what's so interesting about the U.S., you know, some countries really don't believe in industrial strategy and don't do it. Uh, my own country, Italy, where I'm at least originally from, I sound American because my father was then kind of flown over to the U.S. to do nuclear fusion at right. Princeton University, all funded basically by the U.S. <laughs> government. And Princeton does a bit of it. Um, anyway, um, uh, uh, what's interesting about the U.S. is they say they don't believe in industrial strategy, but actually they do it. You know, again, all the organizations I talked about in both the entrepreneurial state and mission economy, uh, whether it's, you know, NIH, SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, um, the obviously the DOD and the DARPA kind of investments, which without which Google wouldn't have an, you know, internet <laughs> to <laughs> work with, uh, you know, Uber wouldn't have a GPS <laughs> to guide it and so on. All those came out of ambitious public programs, which definitely would fit under an industrial strategy heading, and yet they continue to talk with the Jeffersonian talk. Um, and interestingly, Europe, I think, which talks more of a Hamiltonian talk, actually does more of a Jeffersonian walk. So it's almost right. the opposite. Like, <laughs> they pretend there's an active state, and actually there isn't. Um, right. And by the way, my whole work is not about state versus private. It really is about the nitty gritty details, how to do public policy better, how to think about corporate governance, in a more purposeful led way, but also how to bring missions at the kind of interface of the two and moonshot approach has to be at the interface of right. public and private. Um, but the problem is if you don't talk the Hamiltonian thing, then there's not learning between organizations. And one of the things we do in my Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose is foster a platform 
or global public organizations of the DARPA type, like in Chile, there's Corfo, but you don't know that, or you know, YASMA, the public venture capital fund in Israel, or CITRA in Finland, Vanova in Sweden, or public banks like BNDS in Brazil or the KFW in Germany, which are actually quite explicitly mission oriented in the sense that they don't see their roles. If you just look at their websites as fixing a little problem and incentivizing business, but really transforming the landscapes in which they are. And of course, working with the private sector to do that. The BBC, very mission oriented organization. We foster a conversation between them about what are the challenges and opportunities that you face in your organization, but also between organizations, when you step out of that safe box of market fixing and come out of the closet and actually say, you are shaping and co-creating markets. What does it look like for a culture? What does it look like for a portfolio, risk reward approaches? What does it look like with your discussion with the treasury, the ministry of finance, in terms of evaluation of your program? And we call this a mission-oriented innovation network. And I, I'm glad to say that with a new, a new funding from the Hewlett Foundation, we've just launched it in the US. Um, and it, it's super interesting. I mean, like the conversations, which again, don't happen publicly because for some reason the US likes to continue to talk the Jeffersonian <laughs> talk, right. uh, you know, behind the screens. It's just fascinating. And there's so much learning that could be had if this was rendered much more open, which is what our ambition is. Yeah. And then thinking about missions in terms of the long haul, how can governments, especially places like the US and the UK where there's an election cycle every four or five years, how do you stick with these longer uh, ambitions? Yeah, really good question. And that's why it has to come to the organizational level too, which is how can you have an organization like DARPA where people come in for five years, it's independent of the electoral cycle. You are explicitly you know, told that your career uh, within even that five-year period is based on how much risk you're willing to take, not just how many kind of safe bets you're after. Um, and so that's the first thing to actually welcome that experimentation at the organizational level. But in terms of the political process, the problem is that if this is just some sort of pet project of a minister who then, you know, because of the election is, you know, uh, superseded or, or prime minister or president and so on, obviously it's not going to be kind of a resilient uh, it's not going to create resilient and transformative change, at least in the long run. So, um, I mean, there's so many things to unpick there. I mean, the first is the more that the missions themselves can be on the back of also consensus across society, that there's certain things we must be going after, you know, again, climate and global warming, you would think would have achieved by now, given what we see right. happening around the world with floods and fires and so on. Ideally, there would be consensus there. However, if we haven't even bothered to communicate, you know, because we were talking before about narratives and, you know, about just public investment, but the broader thing is how do we communicate in a way that's also not condescending, that you don't just tell everyone you must believe in global warming and we mm -hmm. must do this and that, but actually foster those conversations on the ground. And, you know, I've been seeing on the back of Brexit, which I, by the way, thought was <laughs> the biggest mistake ever. But anyway, on the back of the Brexit debate, there was lots of citizen assemblies, which was so interesting to see that kind of fostering, or, you know, in the US elections, sometimes there are these town hall meetings. Right. What would it look like actually to use those fora in society to debate these kind of things, not just, you know, Brexit or do we want Trump or not, but how do we actually tackle these SDGs? But it has to be at a level that people get it, that, that makes sense for their community, for their neighborhood. We're doing this in Camden in London where I live. It's in North London here. You can see Camden out my window. That's Camden. <laughs> well, there it uh, is. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm chairing the Camden Renewal Commission with the local leader of Camden Council. And we're, as I mentioned briefly before, bringing this conversation about global warming to youth centers, to um, you know, housing estates, really getting as much citizen interaction. And there's lots of debate, but you know, fostering also public spaces where people feel safe to disagree. As, as opposed to social media and the kind of you know Facebook <laughs> type right. of um, you know uh, hate stuff that we see out there, that itself is, I think, a should be a real priority for modern democracies because I think it's not going to happen just by top-down dictation of what needs to be done. But again, getting organizations of the DARPA type to not just be in the Department of Defense, but also in health, in energy, and funding them adequately to have programs that are politically independent. Again, Italy is so interesting because we, you know, develop very quickly like China did. I think Italy and China are the countries that develop the quickest from being agricultural societies to industrial, like in a really short time span. And in Italy, that wouldn't have happened without a state-owned enterprise called EDI, 
the, la istituzione della ricostruzione um, italiana, and it had three phases, public and not politicized at all. The top managers wanted to work in Edi. It was an honor. They right. ended up creating the Autostrada del Sole from north to south in just eight years, the motorway. Very efficient, innovative, etc. Then the second phase was public, super politicized, where all the parties got their hands in and you know divvied it right. up. Failure. Third phase was uh, privatization, complete failure. <laughs> right. So it just reminds us that it's not about public or private, but how we organize a public program, how we organize a private program really matters. And public programs that are public, purpose oriented, but depoliticized and not having all the different parties or you know having their little piece of the pie right. is very important. But what that means for organizational design is hugely important. And that's why the DARPA model is so interesting. But it shouldn't yes. just be around defense. We have to start thinking of how to apply that to social concerns. Right. Yeah, and as we start to wrap up with the last few questions, I'm wondering, so it seems like the, these mission approach uh, is very applicable to places like the US or the UK that are wealthy countries that have a long history of uh, organizational stability. It, are these approaches also applicable in nations where there's maybe not that history of stability in the government or in the um, private sector or the public sector rather? Um, so I think it's even more important for the uh, those kinds of countries that really have challenges in terms of developmental pathways, but also, for example, what sometimes happens in countries with weak states mm -hmm. is a lot of corruption and capture and so on. Right. That means we have to change the way the state actually operates and we need metrics. We need kind of new principles around public value and public purpose. So instead of just saying the state has to be stronger for the sake of being stronger, there's right. also accountability to that strength. And that's incredibly important for countries that, for example, might have you know, issues around corruption. And again, Italy, I can say it because I'm Italian, you know, we invented <laughs> that, you know, the mafia, hey. But you know, the mafia itself, how interesting, the mafia came about in an era where Italy had a very weak state. There was, especially in the South, very, well, your name, Bon Jovi, I assume you have some sort of it, Italian yes, connection. Yeah. Yeah. If you go and, back, yeah. <laughs> and musical, are you related? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no. Okay, anyway, sorry. Same um, name. So, <laughs> I just, um, so in Italy, the mafia came about because there was very little governance of the South, especially in Sicily. And there was a mutual self-help group called La Società de Beati Paoli, which was the modern seed of what today is the mafia. Uh, Cosa Nostra in Sicily, which is so deep, if you think about it, weak states produce mafias, <laughs> and we right. know that's true. And so rethinking the state, rethinking what we need from our bureaucracy, and a dynamic decentralized network of state actors which work alongside the private sector is, I believe, incredibly important in you know countries that are, again, um, developing and have weak states. But that does mean that it's not just about missions that can just be set by a dictator, but it is about these intra-organizational issues that we talk a lot about and I talk about in the book around, for example, what is then public purpose? What is public value? What does a, you know, what does a, what does it mean to talk about directionality and not just kind of putting public money in, having a portfolio approach, but also accountability of what's in that portfolio and how to think about the kind of risk taking and sharing of the rewards and making sure that the objectives themselves that we're going after are again kind of widely seen as important and not just someone's pet project, which again can be a, a random minister who just wants their reputation to, you know, be great right. during their four years. Uh, but we've, I'm, I work very closely with South Africa, for example. I'm an advisor to Cyril Ramaphosa, and you know we've been thinking a lot there about, for example, state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, huge energy company in South Africa, you know, just because it's public doesn't mean it's good. In fact, to be honest, right. it's been part of the problem, not part of the solution. So what is not just the public private conditionality that we talked about before, but public public conditionality? What should be the condition for ESCOM to exist to get the money from the treasury? What is its role in South Africa's energy transition versus just holding on to incumbent kind of power and monopoly positions, which unfortunately is, is you know, the current state of the situation. So, so that conditionality and that focus on transformation and shaping of markets to be more innovation-led, inclusive, and sustainable requires a design change even for that partnership. Yeah, and, and our last question. So you, towards the end of your book, you have a note about how a lot of the research that you build on and that you're looking at um, has been conducted by women. Is this something that you expected to see? And does it give you some optimism about the future and about the uh, future for this mission-oriented approach? 
I think, I mean, it definitely gives me optimism, but to be honest, it shouldn't surprise us. I mean, in the history of, you know, art, mathematics, and all sorts of things, there was women uh, thinkers who were just simply ignored. Uh, you know, Camille Claudel with Augusto Raudan, you know, everyone knows Raudan, no one knows about Camille Claudel, but this is this has often been true. And I think what's so interesting though, is that women thinkers in, in economics have often actually put life at the center of their theory. You know, whether we think of the work of Eleanor Ostrom around, you know, the common good kind of approaches. Um, I've, I've been very inspired also by the work of Stephanie Kelton, who's in, a, in the council that I've just set up for the World Health Organization on the economics of health for all and how she says, you know, we shouldn't always ask, where is the money? First ask what the problem is. And then of course we can create the money. We always do that with war. No one has ever said, oh, sorry, there's no money. We can't go to <laughs> Afghanistan. We found the money, <laughs> but we tend to only find the money when it's kind of a military uh, urgency but also the work of Kate Rayworth around the circular economy. My very good friend, Carlota Perez, who is now over 80 years old, a Venezuelan historian, she's amazing. She's looked at long waves in a kind of Schumpeterian way, long waves of uh, technological change and what it actually meant for the intersection between finance, productive capacity in the state, and very much putting kind of public goals at the center. So it's not surprising to me, but it is important to put all these different pieces together. My own work on the entrepreneurial state, notions of public value and missions with these other uh, works to really think of the new theory that's required to lead also new practice and vice versa. There's an interrelationship between theory and practice and we have to uncover the kind of you know useless uh, economic theory that unfortunately has been guiding a lot of policymaking. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk through these really important issues with us. Thank you. I so, enjoyed it. Mariana's book, Mission Economy, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. I really do recommend that you check it out. For everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Talks at Google event. Please stay safe and take care.